Listen, I love the deal business. I've been in the deal business for my whole career. I mean, so really for 30 plus years, I've been in this business and it's a great business. I mean, everything about it is great. I get to uh, really kind of make my own decision, decide what works for me. And I live with the consequences, good and bad. I mean, I make a good decision and I live with it. And if not, uh, then, then the opposite, but it's really a good business and real estate is a great asset class to be involved with. That was Joel Block. Hang on for an education session. The limited partner shares in the potentially outsized returns of a well-planned and executed investment, but as a passive investor and has the maximum leverage on their most precious asset, their time. And that is why we're here together. 90% of the millionaires out there built their net worth with real estate. However, 0% of the billionaires are hands-on managing the real estate assets because there simply isn't enough time. My name is Jake Wiley, and for the past 16 years, I've been investing in real estate, and I've learned a thing or two. But the most important lesson is how to leverage the expertise and time of others to maximize your investment potential. Welcome to the Limited Partner Podcast. All right. Welcome, partners. This is another great episode. I'm really excited to get into it. So this week, I've got Joel Block. So Joel is a hedge fund manager and a general partner at Bullseye Capital. Joel, welcome to the show. Hey, Jake. Thanks, man. How are you? I am doing great. I'm really excited to see where we end up today. You never know where these questions may go, but you never know. You never yeah, know. You never know. And I guess to start it off, Joel, I'd love to kick it over to you. Give us a little bit of background on yourself. I mean, you do motivational speaking. You're a general partner. You've raised funds. You've been in hedge funds. I mean, the market is in a really interesting place. So I do imagine that we will go into some uncharted territories here today. I started in the CPA business. I was at Price Waterhouse as a youngster doing tax work for a giant syndicator. And I hated doing the tax work, but loved reading the partnership agreements and thought, this is what I want to do. I want to do the same thing these guys are doing. And sure enough, that's kind of where I ended up is in this business. And you know, I started a little syndication firm with another guy. We built that. Then I fell into a venture capital transaction, raised a bunch of money and built a company, which I ended up selling to a Fortune 500. And then I've just been in the deal business ever since. And what happens is that after you accumulate a great amount of time and you get a little gray hair, you start getting invited to share with people some of what you know. And so because I have been around the block a few times, I know a few things and, and audiences want to hear, they want to learn from what you've learned. And that's kind of what keynote speaking is. So, and then in about 15 years ago, I got a call from an executive at Marks and Millichap and he asked me if I wouldn't come to their office or come to Florida and teach them how to raise capital. And that turned into what now is our syndication hedge fund symposium where we educate real estate professionals on how to set up funds and structures, the kinds of deals that your limited partners would invest in. So no one has set up more syndications, funds and structures than maybe we have. I mean, we're certainly a top tier of those people. So I'm not an attorney. I do have someone that I farm all the attorney work to, but myself, I'm a businessman and I advise real estate people on how to set up their structures and how to be effective in this business. Well, I love that. And being a former or a PwC guy myself, I definitely sat in the chair and understand what you're talking about. You look across the table and you see the guys doing the really interesting stuff. But let's, I guess, pick on that transition a little bit. Was it a good move? If What gets you really excited about what you're doing now? Well, listen, I love the deal business. I've been in the deal business for my whole career. I mean, so really for 30 plus years I've been in this business and it's a great business. I mean, everything about it is great. I get to uh, really kind of make my own decisions. I get to decide what works for me and I live with the consequences, good and bad. I mean, I make a good decision and uh, I live with it. And if not, uh, then, then the opposite, but it's really a good business and real estate is a great asset class to be involved with. I've been involved in a lot of different asset classes and I now share my experience with the media and with other kinds of organizations, associations, corporations, et cetera. And it's just been a good run. Well, let's dive into maybe some syndication type conversations. So one, where do you think we are right now in kind of the market cycle? Everything's kind of changing. What are your recommendations for those of us out there looking to one, get into it or two, make some future investments? So let's talk about that. You know, limited partners tend to be people who are so busy working that they don't really have time to do everything that they'd like to do with their portfolio, with their cash. They want their money to work as hard as they do. And they don't have access to the deal flow. They don't have access to really a lot of the inside track that hopefully the people that they invest with, that they have. 
And so the people, what we call these, these syndicators or people who are really in the know, we call those advantage players. Those are people who have the inside track on something. The inside track means that brokers call them first. It means that they get access to deals first. And because they get access to deals first, it means that limited partners get better deals with them. Even if they only get a percentage of what the total take home is, it's probably better than they could do by themselves. And they're doing it absolutely passively. So it's very good for everyone. It's a very good formula. And you got to remember that this business is about 60 years old, the syndication business. It was developed about 60 years ago. A lot of people don't like it, but every single uh, congressperson invests in these deals. Every CPA and every attorney learns how to do these deals in college when they're going to school. The government doesn't, or the IRS doesn't like these deals, but the Supreme Court said that they're legal because they provide a certain amount of tax benefit that the IRS doesn't like. But you know, if you do the structure the right way, and there are things that I see these general guys doing wrong. A lot of the guys who want to be GPs that they do wrong. The first thing that I throw out on the table is that they try and make up a deal that's not institutional grade. They just make up the terms and they say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, and they make up all these crazy terms. And then a limited partner gets a hold of the package and says, I don't really understand how this works. Let me pass it to my attorney. And the attorney says, gee, I'm going to have to spend a lot of time and money reviewing this deal. Would you like me to look at it? And the limited partner says, you know what? I'll just find another deal that's more simple. So there are many things that I counsel GPs about. Simplicity and recognizability is one of the first ones that I tell them, you got to do something that everybody recognizes because this industry is well known, well understood. And you don't want to be making it up as you go along. I think that's a really great point. Now, I do want to kind of poke in a little bit more on when you're talking about institutional grade, a deal, something like that. Can you explain what you mean there? Well, institutional grade is probably not the right phrase because an institutional grade deal would be something that a pension fund would invest in. Those tend to have much smaller rates of return. They provide the limited partner who's a professional investor with a little bit more control and some additional responsibilities. I mean, if you're a giant pension fund and you put a billion dollars into something, you're not just going to go back and watch TV and see how football's doing. You're going to keep a careful eye. You're going to assign a team of people to watch that deal. That's very different than what happens when an individual person, a doctor, an attorney, a business person, whoever the limited partner is, invests in a project. That person literally puts the money in and then goes about their business and sort of hopes that everything works out. Now, they don't tend to keep a careful eye on it because they don't have the rights built into the deal. So it's not so much about institutional grade. An institutional grade deal would provide certain kinds of protections for the institutional investor who's investing very large sums of money, but rather, that it would just be set up in a way that is kind of recognizable. It's industry standard. Maybe that's a better way of putting it, that there's an industry standard way of laying out a deal. And I encourage everyone to try to stay inside the framework of industry standard. Yeah, I think that's a really great point because to your earlier point about making a deal complicated, there's really no reason to do that. This is been around for forever. Good GPs know what they're looking at. Contracts aren't so different, right? Everybody's got nuances. But I guess, why do you see people trying to create terms or create a deal? Well, if I was to really put my finger on it, there are some people who don't see this as a business. They see it as a one-time opportunity to grab every possible thing that they can off the table. And I really tell people, listen, take a little bit less stay in the game for a long time. It's a marathon, not a sprint and be in this business for a long time. Keep these investors for a long time. You'll make plenty of money. You don't have to make all of it on the first deal. Just take your time and it'll work out. A lot of people who try to do something different than that have a different perspective. I don't really much care for those perspectives. And by the way, it's rare to ever see anyone with that perspective be successful. So just for clarification too, you're talking about GP sponsors looking to yes. juice the deal, right? Take every opportunity, use every fund, every fee, everything they can imagine to kind of tweak the deal to get the most out of it. Well, listen, it's totally legitimate to be paid for what you do because the deal does require a certain amount of services. And somebody's got to service the deal. Somebody has to be paid to be the broker, to be the mortgage broker, to be the property manager. And if the GP is qualified to do that, there's no reason that person shouldn't be the best person to do it because that person has kind of a back end interest as well as a front end interest. But what ends up happening is that sometimes people go, you know, I could flip one of my own deals into this thing. I can't tell you how many times people have come to me and say, Joel, I've got this property, it's a total turd. It's just totally not working out for me. 
do you think I could syndicate that to some other people? I said, no, you can't syndicate that to other people. If it's not working out for you, why would it work out for them? And there are just are some things that people, I don't know what they think. They think there's a magic bullet here. Those are not people who are destined to be successful. And I, and I would imagine limited partners can sniff those people out right away. And if you can't, then you probably need to talk to some other people, either an investment advisor or somebody that can help you to think straight about what's going on and the deals that you're getting involved in. I really like that point because part of the reason I've created the show in this community is to focus on exposure to different general partners, syndicators, because it is who you're dealing with, how they've worked in the past. Like, do they have repeat LPs coming into the fund? Have they been around for a while? Do they have a good reputation? And I think that just getting to know people and hearing what they have to say and the way they look at the business should help with a lot of that, getting to know them and help them sniff it out, right? Because it's not as simple as just going to your broker and saying, hey, I need to invest in some funds, right? Like stock funds. It's very different because you're, you're kind of getting into an illiquid investment for a long period of time with somebody and you got to know that you really want to be there. Yeah, and there's a couple other things too. When you invest in something that's going to be coming to you through your stock brokerage house, the balance sheet of the stock brokerage house is standing behind that investment. And now the returns are probably going to be rather low. The risk profile is a little bit lower, but you're also not getting access to the very coolest deals, the very best deals, the very most interesting deals. You're not getting that. You're getting very run of the mill kind of stuff. And there's tons and tons of overhead built into this, tons and tons of commission dollars built into those things. Typically speaking, when limited partners get involved in general partner deals, the kind of things that we're talking about, the risk profile is a little higher because dealing with smaller companies brings with it risks that dealing with Merrill Lynch and these giant companies does not have. But, you know, really big money is not made in those stockbrokers' house. That's kind of the tortoise and the hare. It's kind of slow and steady. Whereas some of these really big opportunities come from the general partner, limited partner model. And by the way, those are called private securities. So public security is a security that is sold on the stock market that anybody who can buy. And those are regulated. They're examined by the Securities and Exchange Commission and before they're ever put onto the stock market. The deals that we're talking about are called private, and those are typically exempt from regulation because in 1929, when the stock market crashed, the whole thing fell apart. The government rushed in and said, gee, we have to be more careful about who we let invest because what happened was a lot of widows and orphans ended up on welfare or what became welfare, and the government had to take care of these people. I'm not really convinced that the government really cares that much whether you win or lose, but they don't want to have to take care of you on welfare at their expense. So what ended up happening in 1933 and 34 is they built the SEC and all the regulatory frameworks that we still use now. And they basically said, listen, every single dollar in this country that anybody's going to put into an investment has to come through our office. And the entrepreneurs of the day in the early 30s came to the table and they said, listen, we totally get why you want to examine this stuff, but this is a terrible idea to examine everything because it's going to stifle entrepreneurship. It's going to slow down innovation. It's going to be terrible for our country. And the United States has always been the most innovative country on the planet, and it's going to slow all that down. And the government, in their correct judgment, said, all right, look, tell you what, if you deal with well-heeled people who are not going to go on welfare if they lose some money, then we'll let you go without a regulation. And that's exactly how the rules work. If you mostly deal with wealthier people, then they don't examine you. So these private securities are securities that are not examined. And there's securities that are for really designed for wealthier people, the top 3% of people in the United States. And by the way, I'll make two more comments on this. One is that the private securities market, a lot of uh, syndicators in these early stage general partners, has anybody ever heard of these before? Like, I've never heard of it. How do I know people heard of it? Well, let me just tell you that the private securities market in the United States is bigger than the entire United States stock market. And you think, how is it possible that this could be bigger than the whole United States stock market? It's because almost every single real estate asset in the country is held in private placement. It's held in a private format. All films are made this way. All venture capital transactions are made this way. Real estate deals are made this way. So a lot of the early stage stuff is all done in private placement. It's just the way that it's done. The second thing is in 2005, six, seven and beyond, it started to become known to regular people that these private placements were really designed for wealthier people and that they weren't getting a chance to play ball. And they started getting very upset that you had to be a millionaire in the United States to make any money, to invest in these kinds of transactions. So they started working on changing the rules around a little bit so that 
more regular people, not just wealthy people could play ball in this arena. And we could talk about any of those things too. Well, I think you really hit the nail on the head. One, for the part of the reason for the show is educating folks on what's available to them. Like you are right. It is a larger market than the stock market, but most people don't even know that it's available to them. <laughs> and that's like a, a rich dad, poor dad kind of theme of the book is that like the rich keep getting richer because they have things that are open to them that maybe they haven't seen before. And I think that's a really, really great point. But one thing I want to go back to as well is you mentioned about sponsors, general partners getting paid. And I totally agree with that because I think there's a lot of people out there that want to see them eat last, right? It's, we're going to skin this thing up for you and like, you get all our money back and then we'll get paid. I actually don't believe in that philosophy. I think that along the way, like the general partners contributing time, effort, and their relationships to make sure that the deal works. And I think they should get paid for that. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it's not that people don't want the general partner to eat. I think it's that they don't want the general partner to get fat. They don't mind that they get fat on the back end if we're all sharing in the profits together. But what people don't want is for you to take all your money on the front end, leave them holding the bag on the back. That's really what they're concerned about. I mean, if you're going to hire a real estate broker, might as well hire the general partner. If you're going to hire a mortgage broker, might as well hire the general partner because the general partner is not getting a salary typically. Now, if they're getting a salary, or they're getting some regular stipend, maybe that's a different story. But a lot of times what I encourage our guys to do is not to be a part of the overhead, but rather just to be part of the cash flow and take some fees. It's not in the limited partner's interest for the general partner to go broke. When a hard money transaction, if a hard money lender makes a loan to somebody and they make a 55% loan and there's 45% equity in a the deal, they kind of hope that the borrower goes broke because they want that property back. And they typically only make loans on properties that they want to get back because they're in the business of taking those properties back and they know what to do with them. If Dr. Smith was involved in a deal and the general partner goes broke and the whole thing falls apart, who is there to rescue the deal? Who is there to grab the control of the situation? Dr. Jones? I mean, these are busy people who don't know the nuances necessarily to make this work out. And by the way, the way these things tend to work is even if they were able to get somebody, let's say you were able to get a substitute general partner to come in, the economic rights probably still belong to the guy that went broke because just because the guy went broke doesn't mean that he doesn't still control his own shares. So there's no economics in these deals that allow for another person to come in and run these deals. And so it's really not in the interest of the limited partners to let the general partner go broke or have some other kind of a problem. It's in the limited partner's interest to make sure that the general partner has pockets that are deep enough and they're taken care of enough that they can keep the lights on because if they can't keep the lights on, all hell breaks loose. It's not in anyone's interest for that to happen. Yeah. And I mean, I think the way I look at it is the limited partnership when it's in existence is a business, right? And it needs to keep the lights on itself, right? It needs to self-perpetuate to keep the general partner at times interested in the deal, right? Now, just so that you're not saying, well, we'll just wait till the end of this thing until you cash out and that's when you're going to make your money. True. But along the way, like you've got asset management, you've got overseeing really the property managers and understanding what's happening? Listen, you, you don't want, you just don't want to starve uh, the general partner because it's not in anyone's interest in the deal. It just is not. It may seem like that's what you want to do, but it is not in anyone's interest for that to happen. Yeah. And I think when you're looking at deals and you understand the economics of the deal and there might be return profiles, if you're looking at separate deals that look different, right? Because one is there's the general partners taking a fee, an asset management fee, and the other ones may say that, hey, I'm not. But I want to see and I want to know how this thing is going to persist. That's my personal view of it. And I actually want to see how the general partner is not going to starve during the whole period. Well, and listen, if you're concerned about teaching due diligence, that's one of the kinds of things that people should look at is how do I know you're not going to go broke or that you'll have so little incentive that you run away and leave us holding the bag? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Well, let's change gears a little bit and talk about the current market, right? Because we're starting to see a shift. The tide has been rising for about a decade now, and we're starting to see that it might be ebbing here. What are your thoughts? What should we be looking out for in today's environment? Well, let me tell you this. When prices are going higher, everybody's smart. And Dr. Smith is may not be the best investor, but Dr. Smith certainly can buy a deal that's going to go up because everything's going up. When things are trailing down, that's really when you need an advantage player. You need somebody who's got the inside track that really knows what's going on. They just kind of have the situational knowledge and awareness to be able to figure out exactly which properties are the ones that are likely to do better than others. 
the ones that have value built in, the ones where there are certain market forces that can go your way. And you need professional assistance more in a time of declining prices than escalating prices. Escalating prices, it's an easy time. Decelerating prices, it's a harder time. So I would imagine that the need for general partners is even greater right now than ever before. How general partners find their projects is uh, as various as there are general partners, but different people have different ways of making assessments. And I think what the limited partners need to be aware of is that they need to be aware that it's hard to find properties in this kind of marketplace, and they need to really understand how the general partner finds those properties and how they're going to turn those properties for a profit, because this is a harder time than it was a year or two ago. Yeah, I think that's exactly it, is that what is the plan? How are you doing this? What are the economics? What are you thinking about the market? I think all of those things should be very obvious when you talk to a general partner or sponsor these days, that if that's not coming to the forefront of the conversation right off the get-go, you probably need to keep looking. What's your strategy in this kind of marketplace? I mean, what was your strategy before? And well, it's the same as before. Well, it can't be the same as before right. because before is gone and now is now. And you really have to do something different. And it's not for me to say exactly what they should be doing differently because everybody's got their own strategy. But the general partner needs to be able to articulate what their new strategy is under these circumstances because the market has really changed. And by the way, and because the market's changing, cash is more valuable. I mean, investors are sitting on cash. Every day the investor wakes up, the cash is worth less. It's evaporating. Cash doesn't ever come back. If the government gets the inflation and the recession and the issues that are on the horizon under control, the cash isn't coming back. What used to be worth 100 and now is worth 92 or 90 or whatever it is, it's not going back to 100. But when you put it into a hard asset, the possibility and the likelihood of it going back to 100 or 110 or whatever it's going to go to is very great. So people want to move their assets out of cash and into hard assets. Investors know that. I'm not telling them what they don't know. They know that they need to move their assets out of the bank and into something that's lucrative. But at the same time, they need to do it in a smart way and they need not to be nervous or desperate about how they move forward. Yeah, I think that's a great point because there is a tendency to kind of freeze up and feel like, hey, the market's uncertain, let's just pull it into cash. And I think that is, to your point, not the way to look at it, right? A tangible asset has the ability to kind of absorb the contraction and I guess accelerate. But cash is never going to change. That's right. Well, awesome. Well, Joel, this has been an incredible conversation. We've gotten a lot of nuggets out of our brief time here together. But I like to finish every episode with a bit of gratitude because somebody along the way probably gave you a leg up that maybe you didn't deserve or took a chance on you. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to give them a shout out and say thanks. Yeah, I've had a lot of people that have been good to me in my career, but probably nobody better than an executive in the media business, uh, Jesse Levine. He was just a great mentor for me and really helped me to see things. I was a youngster at the time when I was doing the venture capital transaction I was involved in. And he really helped me to understand how to be successful in a corporate environment and taught me lessons that have served me throughout my entire career. And I, I love him for it. Well, I hope Jesse was listening to that, but great share. Thank you. Well, Joel, how can my audience get a hold of you? Probably the best thing for them to do is go to joelblock.com. If anybody has something they want to run by me or whatever, we don't have an open fund right now, so we're not selling anything. But if somebody needs some advisory on how to look at a deal or how to examine something, or if they're going to put in a substantial amount of money and they need somebody to look something over for them, I'm happy to pitch in a little bit and help them. I'm not an attorney. I won't do an attorney review. I'm a businessman, but I can dive deep and understand things pretty well, pretty quick. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes. But Joel, thank you so much for being on the show. I learned a lot. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and I'd actually love for you to contribute to a future episode. If you have a question you'd like answered or a topic or a guest to bring on the show, please email me at jake at thelimitedpartner.com. Now I realize there's a lot of lingo that's thrown around on these shows, so I've created a cheat sheet for you with the top 26 terms that come up most often. Head on over to thelimitedpartner.com forward slash lingo for the list. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time.